the reason I'm so excited about it is it's a way that we can go in the lab and measure a feature that we might associate with what we call life and allow us to test hypotheses about the mechanisms for the origin of life and also to look for alien examples on other planets. So first I have to ask you about assembly theory. And, and then we're going to talk about oh, what is the possible relationship of assembly theory with its uh, highly computative and, and um, notions of complexity and even into entropy and thermodynamics. What is the relationship between that consciousness and life? Are they, are they kind of um, necessary and sufficient? Or what's the relationship between consciousness and, and uh, assembly theory and life? Assembly theory is born, is like, uh, it's born out of an interest in solving the origin of life question. And so with the origin of life, you're presented with the issue that you need to be able to di differentiate when the, you know, like the transition from non-living to living matter happens. So you have to have some, in some sense, what, what my colleague Paul Davies, who I know has been on the show too, calls a life meter. You need some measure of like, this was not alive and this is alive. And it turns out that's very non-trivial to do, obviously, um, because in some sense, what you're doing is formalizing a notion of what life is and, and making it experimentally testable. And so the way that we've actually managed to do that and why I'm so excited about assembly theory is assembly theory is a conjecture that life is the only mechanism the universe has for generating complex objects. And the, the key conjecture there is, you know, if you think about chemical space, chemical space is like the space of all possible molecular configurations. And you can have like very simple molecules like methane, which is just a carbon attached to, you know, several hydrogen. But then you might have more complex molecules like DNA. And there's some boundary from the simple to the complex that you actually need to have information or selection or evolution to cross. And uh, assembly theory has a way of formalizing that. We talk about it in terms of the assembly index and the copy number of the object. The assembly index is the minimal number of steps. If you, if you take parts like the, the bonds that make up a molecule, or it's easier for people often to think about Lego building blocks. If you take the blocks and you stick them together and then you take parts and you build them again, any parts that you've used you can reuse, and you look at the minimal structure of a path to get to a complex object. So it might be like a molecule of DNA in chemistry, and it might be like Hogwarts castle in Lego. And so if you see such a complex object in high abundance, it's suggestive that there had to be an evolutionary mechanism to create it. And so assembly theory makes a conjecture that there's a formal boundary, in, or that there's actually a physical boundary. There's a complexity threshold only life can cross. And we can measure assembly index in the lab with standard laboratory equipment like mass spec. And so my colleague Lee Cronin, who originated the ideas of assembly theory, actually derived it as a measure because he wants to do original life experiments in the lab and, and be able to verify it experimentally. And so uh, his lab went in and took non-living and living samples, things like Murchison meteorite, which is a really complex inorganic sample from the early solar system, you know, whiskey, and they basically were able to classify, you know, in a sort of with mass spectrometry, the complexity or the, the assembly is actually the more formal way of saying it, the assembly of these different kind of molecular systems and show that living things were the only things that generated really high assembly molecules. So that's sort of our starting point is to say that the origin of life is basically the process of crossing this threshold. Um, and that's really the question we were most interested in. But assembly theory offers some new framings of some really interesting questions. And it's super funny with writing the book because I started it before I really got very into assembly theory. It was like already, you know, thinking about information and causation in life and the fact that they were supposed to be fundamental, you know, to what life is. So I had written this paper with Paul more than a decade ago about the origin of life transition maybe being quantifiable in terms of information and causation. But I didn't really think about you know, I wasn't really optimistic that we were going to be able to test these kind of ideas or there was like a really formal mechanism for developing a theory until I started working with Lee on assembly theory. And so I was already writing this book about these ideas about information and causation and a transition of the origin of life and new fundamental physics needed. And at the same time, I was like developing this theory with Lee. Um, so a lot of it ended up in the book, which is kind of exciting. But the reason I'm so excited about it is it's a way that we can go in the lab and measure a feature that we might associate with what we call life and allow us to test hypotheses about the mechanisms for the origin of life and also to look for alien examples on other planets. Because now if we're saying we're not looking for DNA or we're not looking for amino acids that you know, happen to be used in proteins on Earth, we're actually going out and looking for complexity in the universe. To me, that seems 
a much more agnostic and tractable way of searching for life. This doesn't get to like the deep questions of the nature of consciousness and stuff like that yet, but I wanted to give kind of like the background of like the pragmatic approach. And yeah, so so we can get into to some of that unless unless there's like a specific thing you want to ask about what I've said so I, far. I just, you know, can you have, I mean, you talk about life, there are examples of burgeoning life, potential life. Uh, my favorite example are, you know, oil droplets. And, and of course, there's inevitably the notion of panpsychism, which I find, you know, almost virulently, you know, toxic to the to the soul. But but that might be my, uh, pre, uh, you know, predilection. You know, at what level is consciousness a requirement? Or maybe I'm totally wrong, and maybe you know, life is a prerequisite for consciousness. Although, if you believe in panpsychism, that's not the case, right? I, I think the aversion I'm, I'm I'm feeling from you is just the physicist normal aversion to like if I can't measure it, and it's it, you say it's a property of everything, like it's not really helpful and. Some sense, or at least that's sort of sometimes how I feel about uh, different panpsychist arguments. Like, it's an interesting idea, but what's the testable hypothesis there, and how do I measure it? And the issue with the problems of life and consciousness has just traditionally been that we have a very subjective and, and colloquial ideas about what these phenomena are. But the reason that they're so hard is we haven't regularized a concept of consciousness or uh, life that we feel like that really, you know, captures what we do in the scientific method to validate theories, right? So for me, I, I kind of think of the state of life and consciousness, like trying to talk about gravity before the generation of Newton and Galileo. Like you could talk about things falling and you could make observations about, you know, certain planets and, you know, like, you know, wandering stars, you, you would call them, you wouldn't even know they were planets, right, in the night sky, but you would have no formal way of making a connection that they had the same mechanism and you would have no concept of something that we later came to understand as the theory of gravitation. So we knew gravity existed long before we had a theory or a way of measuring its existence or understanding what it was. And I think life and consciousness, we have ample evidence that they're real features of our reality, but we don't know how to talk about them. And so what we have seen in the history of physics repeatedly is that when we find new ways of measuring things and, and new ways of testing uh, ideas, we come up with theories that seem very counterintuitive in what they say about what those phenomena are. Gravity, you know, originally, like, you know, maybe people would think that, you know, like the color of an object mattered to its attraction to the planet, or actually, you know, like there's always the famous experiments about like trying to test whether friction mattered or not with feathers and balls and these kind of things, right? So people didn't really know what the relevant properties were. They had to identify mass was a relevant property. And, you know, over many centuries that led to us realizing things like once you assume, you know, like you, you have clocks and you can measure the constancy of the speed of light, then you get to things like the curvature of space time is necessary to explain the fact that we're sitting in our chairs. So very counterintuitive things come out of the fact that we reason from measurements we, we can make. In the case of life, I think this is, this is why I'm excited about assembly theory is because it is something we can go in the lab and measure. We, we really think this is a property of molecules. It's not that you can just measure it with a mass spec. Lee's lab has an amazing paper where they show that they can measure it in infrared and NMR spectroscopy, and they get consistent values for the same molecule across different measurement modalities. So this idea that the causation or complexity built into a molecule is actually a physical feature of the molecule is now a measurable attribute. And if you can validate an experiment that life is the only thing that generates high complexity, that gives you a starting point for scaffolding into a theory that would explain the regularities that we associate with life. And so that's sort of where we're at. And the regularities I'm most interested in there that relate to your question of consciousness and what I discuss in the book is this idea that life is sort of the universe's way of exploring the space of possibilities that could exist when that space gets too large. And it does it by building these objects stepwise and making them deeper and deeper in time. So this, this idea of this assembly index as like a measure of how much causation or time went into building an object or how much information actually becomes a feature of the object. So evolved objects are now things that don't just have a physical size, like you can mention measure the three dimensions, but they actually have a size and time. Um, and this is the sort of very radical departure that and like philosophical leap that I've made with assembly theory that, you know, is the biggest departure from standard physics. But the reason I'm excited about it is it reconciles a lot of issues with why fundamental physics and also our current theories of physics have been inadequate to solve the origin of life or explain life that I had covered with Paul in that pa early paper long before assembly theory. We, we pointed out a whole bunch of hallmark features that we couldn't really reconcile, and I think assembly theory will solve all of them. Where it gets interesting for consciousness is as 
evolve evolutionary structures become deeper and deeper in time they're bigger in this hot, like very they're getting larger and larger in this very high dimensional space the assembly space which is about this you can almost think of it as a space of functions um, if you want to do a computational analogy but assembly theory is very different than computational complexity theory or what has come out of computer science as far as like theoretical computer science for theories about the nature of computation it says some very different things but it has some some similarities in terms of what it says about the structure of reality that people might think sound more like a theory from how people think about the universe as a computation than they do as a theory of physics. But it's a physics theory, so it's, it's in this interesting intersection. But as far as the problem of consciousness, what I think assembly theory can say about it is that as structures become evolutionary deep, more deep. They, they, they have more of their physical structure in this sort of temporal structure, this sort of like rolled up amount of causation in the present object than they have in the spatial structure. And things that have that that are very, very causally deep might be things that we associate as being conscious because they have a very large inner world, so to speak, um, because there's a lot of history wrapped up in one physical structure.